want to talk to us today on the topic, I choose to love the Lord. I choose to love the Lord. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 28 and reading through verse 31. And the King James text today reads as follows. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he, meaning Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, Savior, Master, Redeemer, we love you, Lord. We appreciate today the house of God. We appreciate the opportunity to hear the preached word of God. For it is through the preached word of God that our faith is able to grow and prosper. And Lord, the word of God declares that We ought to prosper in our lives even as our soul prospers. But it is the preached word of God that allows and enables our soul to prosper. Master, today we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to reside upon the messenger of God. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to reside upon every hearer. Master, cultivate hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Tear up that old stony ground. Tear up that old ground full of tree trunks and stones. And Master, today, cause it to become brittle. Cause it to become broken. Cause it to become receptive to the seed of your word, which is about to be planted. Master, in the name of Jesus, we need so much today to understand the truth that I am about to expound upon. Enable us by the Holy Ghost not only to hear the words, Lord, but to hear the message and to receive it gladly that it might spring forth and bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives. Touch us, encourage us, inspire us, uplift us. For we need this today. We ask it all in none other than the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. Most of us at some point in our lives, whether it be in grammar school sometime or middle school, Certainly, most of us, by the time we reach high school, we have experienced the pain of unrequited love. There was some person that we looked upon and we felt a special connection to them. We felt a special attraction to them. Every time we were in their presence, They caused butterflies to flutter in our stomach and we just wanted so much to be able to show them and share with them affection 
because for some reason there was something about them that just caused us to be drawn to them in a special way. And yet, that person did not feel the same way about us. Oh, it didn't matter how much candy you bought them or how many flowers you sent them. Oh, when I was a young man, I was trying, I had issues, I was wrestling with issues in me. I knew my orientation, I knew what was going on inside of me, but I also knew according to the church I grew up in that that orientation was not good and not proper, so I was trying to do everything in my power to find some young woman who would find me lovable and find me attractive. And hopefully maybe one day I'd get married and my understanding of things was if I could just marry some girl, that that would fix me and everything would be right with the world. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in a very negative and abusive home environment. There were any number of times growing up as a kid that I heard the phrase, I wish you'd never been born. And some of y'all watching this are thinking, surely your parents never said this to you. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. I was told on more than one occasion that I should have been aborted. And uh, the people that were supposed to love me, my parents were hot and cold, at least my mother was. Loved you one minute, hated you the next. She could try to pour affection on you one day, and the next day she'd be cursing you and cussing you and calling you every name under the sun and telling you how you were a curse in her life. Say, Pastor, why are you telling us this horrible, ugly story? I'm trying to tell you this story so you'll understand why somebody like me who's looking for someone to love them, why that love being unrequited is so painful. If you grew up with parents that loved you and you knew they loved you, you had no question they loved you, then you really didn't question your lovableness. You really didn't question whether or not you were deserving of another person's love and attention and affection. I didn't grow up with that. I grew up believing that I was less than lovable. Hey, listen, when your mother and dad can't even love you, my father never even tried to feign love. My father, not one day of his life until this very day, he's pushing up on 80 years old. To this day, my father has never one time even tried to act like he loved his kids. He, he never made any effort to do so. My mother did, but as I say, it was hot and cold. One day it was hot, the next day it was cold. And, I mean, you, you wind up growing up with this convoluted sense of self-worth and self-value. I felt like I wasn't at all sure there was anything in the world about me that was lovable. I didn't know if there was anything in the world about me that anybody could be attracted to. My father was especially abusive verbally. He, he once told me, literally once said, that a fat gay man wouldn't even find me attractive. My father told me that. When a person desires love, all I wanted growing up as a kid was to find somebody who could love me. I wanted somebody who could believe in me because I did not believe that the people in my life who were supposed to love me and who were supposed to be 
supportive of me who were supposed to believe in me. I didn't believe for one minute that they really, truly, genuinely did. And there is nothing more crushing than developing a crush on somebody and being attracted to somebody and just wanting so much for them to be able to return the affection that you feel for them and having them say, no, I I don't feel that way about you. I I don't, you know, no, I'm not really interested. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when I was a young man, Oh, and I was trying so hard to do the right thing. I'd find a young lady that I thought was attractive, and and I am a attra- I'm always been attracted to personality as much as looks, you know. So looks was never my high priority. I was very attracted to a certain type of person, and uh, I'd find a young lady that I was attracted to, and. I approached things from a very old-fashioned perspective. I would try to get her attention and garner her affection by sending flowers and giving cards and all these old-fashioned notions. Well, their mothers would love me to death. Their grandmothers would love me to death. But every single girl I tried to win, I kid you not, without fail, They just had no interest in me whatsoever. I was constantly, and I mean constantly, having my heart broken. My efforts at reaching out to someone were constantly being met with rejection and refusal. And it hurt. It hurt a lot. I'm here to tell you today that many, if not most, in the church have polluted and distorted the message of the gospel so much that most believers do not understand today, listen to me, children, that the primary reason Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born in a manger in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, ministered in Galilee, was crucified on the cross of Calvary, buried in a rich man's tomb, and raised from the dead the third day by the glory and power of God. The whole reason this divine drama was carried out before humanity, listen to me, is because God loves us. More than this, it is because God wants us to love him in return. Most people, when if you were to ask most believers today, why on earth did God de- design this drama, this plan from the beginning of time that involved his own coming from heaven and manifesting himself to humanity as one of us. Why in the world did God even go through all this? The answer is simple, and it's in the word of God. But you know what? You don't hear it preached from many pulpits today. Let me go back to our primary text. One of the scribes came and asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? What is the most important commandment? Look at the answer. Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
They always start prayers with that phrase, the Jewish people, because God wants to drive in the mind and in the head and in the thinking of his people that he is one God. Hallelujah. And the same God that is our God is the same one that we call Lord, which means the owner, the ruler of all things. So our God is Lord and our Lord is God. There is not one. One God and another Lord. The Father is not God and the Son is the Lord. No, hallelujah. God is the Lord and the Lord is God. Hallelujah. And that is how every prayer that the Hebrew people pray begins with this reminder. But then immediately after this reminder, we read the phrase, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So what do you figure is the highest thing of, on God's list of priorities? He wants us to love him. If that's the first commandment, oh my God, how hard is this to understand? This isn't very hard to get. If the first commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, but not just love him, love him with every aspect of your being. Love him passionately. Love him energetically. Love him with your mind. Love him with your affections love him emotionally but love him with your strength and with all your soul in other words put all your effort into your relationship with him because you're that much in love with him so if God's first commandment is to love him in this way does that not suggest that his first and primary goal was to win our love? Doesn't the gospel, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, does it not begin with the words, For God so loved the world, hallelujah, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. Oh, preacher who preaches the condemnation, gospel how you have polluted and diluted and destroyed and ruined this wonderful gospel message the whole purpose in the lord's coming was so that god might demonstrate his love to us but it doesn't end there. He demonstrates his love to us. Why? So that we might love him in return. He's not just demonstrated his love to us just because he has nothing better to do. No, he's trying purposely to win our affection. He's trying purposely to earn our respect, our admiration, our affection, and our love. The first commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Am I telling the truth? But God doesn't just demand it. He says, Look at everything I've done to try to win you over. Can you not, oh hallelujah, can you not in the manger find a cause to love me? Can you not 
at the River Jordan find a purpose and a reason for loving me? Can you not on the cross of Calvary find some motivation to love me? Can you not in an empty tomb find some motivation to love me? Oh, hallelujah to God. Can you not through the infilling and the indwelling and the baptism of the Holy Ghost where I literally marry my spirit with your spirit, can you not in all this find some reason to love me? But the Word of God tells us many are called and few are chosen. The truth of the matter is the majority of the world responds to God's gesture toward us and His love is unrequited. Now let's go back to what I was saying about the pain of unrequited love. Just imagine how hurt God is. I did all this for you. I went to such lengths for you. And yet, out of all the world, only a small minority will in truth Love me as I desire to be loved. Because only a small minority will understand in truth what the full reason for my coming and doing what I did was. Only a small minority in truth will be able to receive my love and then return it back to me. Hallelujah. I choose to love the Lord. Why did God create a world full of people who all have freedom of choice? It's easy. It's easy. Stephen, I can answer your question very easily. Because he wanted a bride. The church is described in the word of God as the bride of Christ, is it not? Nobody marries a woman who hates them. Nobody marries a woman who is ambivalent about them. Nobody marries a woman who causes them pain and consternation. No, 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 no. He wants a bride. He wants a love interest. Listen to me, children. He wants a people who have all chosen to love him. Oh, my goodness. Listen carefully. They have not chosen to be fearful of him. He is not seeking a people who are fearful of him. He is not seeking a people who are fearful of hell. He is seeking a people who can look at the evidence and decide that God is indeed worthy of our love and our affection. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Oh, my goodness, have mercy. The Word of God declares we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Hallelujah. He's looking for a people who will choose to respond to His divine overtures by loving Him back. Adam and Eve were given a choice in the Garden of Eden. That choice was simple. They could either obey or disobey. Period. That was the choice. It was a simple choice. There was only one single rule that was established. One. There was only one rule they could break. Therefore, they were given a very simple choice. You can either obey me or you can disobey me. It's that simple. And there's only one thing you can do that would classify as disobedience. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, my Lord, have mercy. 
They had it easy. They didn't have the Jewish law with its hundreds of edicts and hundreds of mandates. They had one rule that they could break. They chose to break it. So today, the Lord seeks a people, listen to me, who will choose to obey his voice and do his will completely and totally from a place of love and devotion. You don't think Mark 12, 28 through 31 contains an explanation of what it is that God seeks from believers, then go back to Deuteronomy 6 and 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. How about Deuteronomy 10 and 12? And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Children today, those who preach a message of fear and doom and gloom do not even understand the most basic truth of the gospel. God loves us and he wants us to love him in return. Not by demand, hallelujah, not by commandment, but rather by Choice. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Remember I told you Adam and Eve had only one rule they could break? Well, with the gospel, it's inverted. We have only one rule that we need to follow. Oh, my God, have mercy. Oh, oh, my God, have mercy. We have only one rule. We have only one thing that God asks of us, and that is to love him, to believe him, to obey him. When I heard the message of Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I was only too happy to oblige. Amen. Because I can't believe this gospel if I'm not willing to obey. Hallelujah. When you believe somebody, you obey. When you believe something, you obey. I've used the analogy so many times. If somebody comes in this building and they walk in and they very quietly and gently say, I just wanted to tell you, your building's on fire, so y'all probably want to get out of here. We'd probably look at them and say, what are they talking about? What kind of nut is going to walk into a church and quietly whisper that the building's on fire and people probably ought to get out of the building? No, no, no. But if a fireman comes in the building and he's screaming, the building's on fire, get out of the building, get out of the building. If you believe the fireman, which you're more likely to believe him because he is somebody who appears to know what he's talking about. If you believe him, you're going to do what he says. The same thing is true of the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you're going to obey the gospel. It's that simple. But God wants us to 
do one thing. Adam and Eve had the opportunity to disobey. We are given the opportunity to what? Obey. The Apostle Paul said, not all have obeyed the gospel. He didn't say not all have believed the gospel. He said not all have obeyed the gospel because within the message of the gospel, there is something we must do. There is something requiring obedience. It begins with believe, but faith without works, James says in James chapter 2, is dead being alone. So there is God prescribed action that we must take in response to our belief. But it all starts with obedience. In John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The law of Moses was given in an effort to draw a clear contrast. What would an authoritarian God who demanded love and loyalty look like? Well, the law shows us the answer. But then from behind the veil of eternity, the God of all creation emerges in the likeness of men to court humanity and to win us to win our love and devotion. Manifest as one of us, he tells humanity that he does not seek a people who follow the rules, but who, if given the chance, will choose to obey his voice and serve him from a place of love and devotion. I've said many times, if people think that this church being LGBT affirming is permissive, if you think that we do not preach a message of holiness and godliness and righteousness, you couldn't be more wrong. The only difference is we do not preach everything is heaven or hell. We preach if you love the Lord as you ought to love the Lord, you're going to do everything in your power, in your power, in your power, in your power to do right and to do good. But you do so not out of fear of condemnation because there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So you don't do anything out of fear of condemnation, but rather you do it out of love and devotion. I don't try to live right. I don't try to live a sober life. I don't try to live a moral life. I don't try to live a godly life because I'm afraid that every little thing I do wrong is going to send my soul to hell. No, I understand the message of the gospel better than that. I understand the potency of God's grace much better than that. But I love the Lord. I love who he is. I love that one day he chose to reveal himself to me so that I might understand that the God of the Old Testament the one who is frequently called, frequently referred to as Jehovah, was manifest in the New Testament 
as Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. That God did not send a Savior. He said, I am the Lord thy God, and beside me there is no Savior. Hallelujah. He did not send a Savior. He came as the Savior. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm grateful that God allowed me to understand the revelation of one God in Christ, and Jesus is his name. I'm glad that God allowed me to understand the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism, for the remission of sin. I'm glad that God un allowed me to understand the empowerment and the intimacy that comes with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Honey, I've got so many reasons to love him. I choose to love the Lord. In 2 Timothy 1 and 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. First John 4, 9, 18. There is no fear in love. Let me repeat that for you. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Fear hath torment. He that feareth, listen children, you got to hear this now. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. There are a lot of Christians running around today scared out of their minds. They're going to miss the rapture. Scared out of their minds, they're going to split hell wide open because some preacher has presented grace to them as being impotent and powerless. And you cannot reach perfection. The word perfection here literally means maturity or completion. You cannot be mature. You cannot be complete in Christ if you're full of fear. Because perfect love casteth out fear. If you understand this thing, then you will understand that there is no reason nor any room for you to fear if you love him. Because the first and the most important thing he wants from you is your love. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you can love him, honey, you can be secure. You can be imperfect. You can have all kind of faults. You can have sin in your life. But if you can love him, you are able to do the primary thing he wants you to do. Hallelujah. You are able to do what he came in order to accomplish and that is to prepare for himself a people, a bride that can love him. Oh, hallelujah. The nation of Israel was given the opportunity to be the Lord's love interest. He set them apart and uniquely gave them his law. That made them a unique people in the world. They were the only people on the planet to be in possession of the law. That's why to this day, the Jewish religion celebrates that they are the possessors of God's law. Nobody else on the planet was handed the law of God by God himself. So that showed that God had a special love and a special devotion and a special interest and a special commitment and a special covenant with Abraham and his descendants. But rather than take advantage of of the Lord's provision and love him for his special calling upon them, 
they became vain in their imagination and prideful in their unique identity. I got news for you today. Many in the church are doing the same thing today. Instead of loving the Lord and manifesting. See, you can't love God and not love people. It's impossible. You cannot love God and not love your fellow man. It's impossible. When you love the Lord, then the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And guess what? The love of God is unconditional. He can love anybody. And so ought you and I be able to love anybody. But listen, we have people today in the church who also have grown vain in their imaginations and prideful in their identity as children of God. But like the wives of Jacob, listen carefully, the Lord was first married to Leah. But the love that he truly sought was that of Rachel. <laughs> Same family, but different women. The church today is Rachel, and Israel is Leah. The Lord walks in covenant with both women. Jacob was married to both women, but the one he sought and the one he desired from the start was Rachel. Oh, hallelujah. In Revelation 2, verses 1 through 5, the Lord speaks to the church at Ephesus, and listen to what he says. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. My word, it sounds like this church had a lot of good stuff going for it. But listen, verse 4, Revelation 2. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Oh, my. What did I tell you God wanted more than anything? He wanted a people who loved him by choice. Hallelujah. A people who chose to love him. He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The Lord did not call the church at Ephesus to return to its first fears, but to its first love. So today, the Lord is calling us back to a place of love. He desires the church return to that place where the grace and love of God are preached, so the penitent might choose to love the Lord for all his goodness and mercy toward us. The word of God said it is the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. The goodness of God. God doesn't beat you into submission. No, he doesn't want anybody to love him because he beat them and told them to. He wants them to love him by choice. We must be restored to that place where the unbeliever is told of the great lengths to which the God of heaven went in order to earn our trust, our love, and our devotion. 
Our God today seeks a people who will love him, not live in terror of him. His desire is to walk in relationship and in intimacy with those who will choose to love him. And today, I hope with me you can say, I choose to love the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.